I appreciated uh, Casey's prayer. You know, one thing that uh, we can forget about uh, if we're not careful is the essential participation of the Holy Spirit in our communication with one another. Uh, it's been well said. I went to a seminar years ago, and this guy who preached, who taught on preaching, he said a lot of people, when you ask them who's involved in preaching or the teaching of the word, they will mention the scripture and they will mention the listener and the preacher, but they often forget the spirit who inspired the scriptures, the spirit who gave life to the hearers and who equipped the preacher and who attends the very preaching and teaching of his word. And that is the role of the Holy Spirit. And we thank God for him. Today, the title is, it, is, it was very good. And we're going to look at the last three days of the first week. Last week, we looked at the record that God gave us of the first four days. <clears throat> Today, we're going to look at the last three days. I divided it there, I mentioned last week, because the nature of the creative work that God did in the last two days fifth and sixth day of his work is substantially different than what he did in the first four days. And I hope to make that evident to us today. Now, I also remind you that last week we read from the Psalms that all the inhabitants of the world shall stand in awe of him for he spoke and it was done. And that is really the recurring theme of my heart that we see in this record of creation the God of heaven spoke it, and it was done. Nothing can withstand his hand. So, Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 20, and we'll go through chapter 2 and verse 3, but right now we're going to read 20 through 23, the fifth day. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. When God formed vegetation, he said, Let the earth bring forth grass, herbs, and trees that bear fruit. Here he says much the same thing, but that which is to abound is described as living creatures. This term living is his work on the fifth day as he gets back to creation. He created sea creatures and winged birds and he calls them living creatures. These were not made from existing matter. These were created and this is God's work to create something. He created living animals, and two things stand out to me, and I hope to make these apparent to you, different from the fourth day. God created these creatures, and they are called living creatures. Plants were sprouted from the earth, not created directly by God. He commanded it, and they, were, they came about. They are not called living or alive in Scripture. The, the website, the ministry answers in Genesis, gives this explanation. What is the difference between plants and animals or man? For the answer, we need to look at the phrase nephesh kaya, and I'm probably butchering that Hebrew phrase. This phrase is used in the Bible to describe sea creatures and land animals and birds and man. Nephesh is never used to refer to plants. Man is specifically denoted as nephesh kaya, a living soul, after God breathed into him the breath of life. This contrasts with God telling the earth on day three to bring forth plants. The science of taxonomy, the study of scientific classification, makes the same distinction between plants and animals. And since God only gave, gave only plants, including their fruits and seed, as food for man and animals, then Adam and Eve and all the animals and birds were originally vegetarian. Plants were to be a resource of the earth that God provided for the benefit of those living creatures, both animals and man. Plants didn't die in the same way that living creatures die. 
they were consumed as food. And scripture describes plants as withering, the Hebrew word yabesh, which means to dry up. And this term is more descriptive of a plant or plant part ceasing to function biologically. Plants aren't inert like rocks, I would say, but they and they do not have breath or volitional movement. And these two characteristics are characteristic of living creatures. They breathe and they have volitional movement. So plants aren't alive in the same sense that creatures are. There's something different, structurally substantially different between a plant and a living creature, an animal. Fish were created to flourish in the water. That's what he says in our text. He created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves that abound in the water. He made them to live in the water. What we know about fish is they've got most, most sea creatures are scaled fish. There are some that aren't. That's a different category of sea creatures. But fishes with scales are designed to move quickly and efficiently through the water. Those scales provide them the means to do that. And they have gills that draw oxygen out of the water. Water has about 5% of the oxygen that air has. Gills can absorb about 85% of the oxygen that is in the water. Fish are more efficient at drawing oxygen out of water than we are at drawing oxygen out of the air. God made them that away. And these other sea creatures that aren't fish are fascinating animals. They have skin, they have all kind of weird characteristics, and God designed them for the environment in which they were placed, providing a variety of life that still amazes man. Birds were designed with a bone structure and with feathers that make flight possible and delightful to watch. The lungs of birds are different than your lungs or the lungs of fish, the gills of fish. They're tube-like structures that take air in from the front and exhaust it to the rear, kind of like your intake and exhaust system on an automobile. And they're designed so that they derive most oxygen, they're most efficient at drawing oxygen out of the air when that bird is flying at high speed and his muscles need the oxygen most. Imagine a little bitty hummingbird and they, they, they flap their wings, I don't know how many billions of times a second. And they can fly fast and they can hover in place. How much energy does it take to do that for a creature this big? God made all of these creatures and he designed them differently based on the environment in which he would place them. Fish and fowl created by the Almighty God on the fifth day to flourish in the sea and in the sky. No accident of evolution Nothing but the deliberate design of the creature. No reason for these sea and air creatures to evolve. Their creator got it right the first time. That's what we need to recognize. God didn't go through trial and error to come up with gills in the fish. So that's the fifth day. Pretty interesting things. The sixth day is what I think is probably the fullest day of the week. It's the high point of creation and it's the culmination of the work that God has been doing in creating all things. First we have the land animals and this is in verses 24 through 25. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, having filled the seas and the air with creatures designed for these environments, God turns his attention to the land, and he commands the earth to bring these creatures forth. He uses different, Moses uses different terms here. God made the beasts of the earth. He created the sea creatures and the fish. And we reviewed the difference between these words earlier. 
God doesn't give us any explanation why the land animals were made rather than created. We do know that while man can make things, God can make things man can't. And therein is the distinction. What is important is to see that with these creatures is that the sea and air creatures were told to be fruitful and multiply, but the land creatures don't get this command. He made them according to its kind, each one of them, but he doesn't command them to be fruitful and multiply. But you know something? He made them to be fruitful and multiply. And their DNA carries with it the command to do so. We know that bugs and beasts procreate. God made them to do that. God made them according to their kind, and he's careful to use that phraseology, and so that we can rest assured that when they reproduce, it's according to their kind. This is the order that he has repeatedly put in his record for us. And so sea creatures and beasts of the land, they don't cross-pollinate and create some, I don't know, monstrosity you would call it. Beasts of the land reproduce according to its kind. This, again, in my mind, is a sign of God's order to all things. God has order in his creation, not chaos, not randomness. Man has been learning much and much more and more about DNA, but is just still scratching the surface of this enormously complex set of instructions that reside in the seed of every plant and creature that reproduces. Some scientists have said that man shares with a banana 97% of its DNA. And I don't know if that's true or not, but they, they say that as if to equate man with banana. 3% difference in DNA makeup, if that, if that percentage is true, 3% makes a big difference. Bananas don't dress themselves, they don't go to school, they don't drive cars, they don't make things. The beasts of the earth shows up, this phrase shows up two dozen times in the Old Testament. It's an interesting phrase, beast of the earth. It usually refers to beasts that eat other animals or that eat the flesh of wicked men. That's how the beasts of the earth show up in Scripture. In describing this type of beast to Job, one of the most ancient saints in the Bible, God described both the behemoth and the leviathan both of which were very large wild animals which Job would have known about, but he wouldn't kept them. He wouldn't have kept them as pets or as food. Behemoth is found in Job 15 or Job 40, 15 through 24, and it's described as having a tail like cedar, ribs like bars of iron, bones like beams of bronze. Leviathan is a sea creature in the next chapter described as having scales so tight air cannot come between them, flame coming from his mouth, his heart is as stone, and he regards iron as straw, bronze as rotten wood. On earth, Yahweh said, there is nothing like Leviathan. One author observed, it seems that God is using examples of beasts of the earth to help Job see that there is much he does not know and that God alone is both creator and caretaker of the wild beast. Now, man tries to write these things off as crocodiles and other things that they can comprehend, but God doesn't leave us that option. You know, when we can't just discard the record of creation because evolution or somebody else tells us it took a long time. And we should not discard the record in Job where God is telling his servant about these enormous creatures that he put on the earth and in the sea. Another thing to note is that when... In our English Bibles, God brought forth cattle. In Hebrew, this isn't simply a reference to the bovine creatures that we use for beef production around here. 
it refers to a larger category of animals, those land creatures that we see later in Scripture are the ones that man domesticated for service and for food. The Hebrew word is used 189 times in Exodus through Deuteronomy, and it mostly refers to food or sacrificial animals, things that we come later to know as sheep, goats, and bulls, and so forth. And even in our day, after long after the first week, man seems to still draw the lines in the same place. There are exceptions, but in large measure, we don't take as pets or as livestock wild beasts. You'd have livestock, sheep, goats, cattle, chickens, pigs, and you have dogs and cats in your house. Or maybe I'm not in your house, depending on how you see dogs and cats. The point being, wild beasts, we in Texas have these things called feral hogs. And they're, they're, they're hogs, just like the hogs that you might have on your farm, but they're feral hogs. And you don't, you don't take them in and put them with your regular hogs. There's lines that God knew about, God established, and they still appear to have large force with us. Now, I had a roommate in college who had a tarantula in an aquarium, you know, and he said that was his pet tarantula. Yeah, he may have had a tarantula, but it was not a pet. We have benefited from a wide variety of domesticated animals used for food and companionship and, and service. And God tells us to take care of these creatures, not to be cruel to them. Proverbs 12.10 says, A righteous man regards the life of his animal. And Proverbs 27, 23 says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and to attend to your herds. See, if you've, if you've been granted care of creatures, God expects you to take care of those creatures. That's an obligation that we have as his stewards of what he's given to us. Those who benefit from creatures are to take care of them, and this is good in the sight of God. Secondly, we have in the sixth day, we have this unique creature, the one made in the image of God. And we're going to read verses 26 through the end of the chapter. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every beast of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. So evening and the morning were the sixth day. This part of the sixth day focuses on what theologians call the crowning glory of creation, man. Man created last this conclusion of creation indicating his position of importance assigned by the creator. Most public speakers know that if you want something to be remembered, you put it at the end of your talk and you emphasize it because you want people to remember that. And I think that's what God's doing here when he creates man and he declares that he is made male and female in the image of God and he puts them as having dominion over all the things that he had just created. All of the work in creating the earth and filling it with food was to provide a suitable habitation for man. 
Note that in this pristine environment, the grass, the herbs, and the fruit-bearing trees were, trees were given for food to every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, and everything that creeps on the ground in which there is life. This is another reminder that vegetation is not alive in the same way as living creatures are. Living things were not food for living things in the garden. In this passage, God says that he will make man, let us make man in our image. And then he declares that he has created man. So God created man in his own image, emphasizing that man is created in the image of God, male and female. And there is so much profound simplicity in that phrase. God went out of his way. He didn't say this about any other creatures. He says this about man, male and female, he created them in the image of God. People in our day, folks that you know, people that you see on the radio, or you hear on the radio, see on the TV, need to go back and read this. There ain't but two. And God made two. And he made them different from one another. All the other living creatures were created in multitudes to fill the sea and the air and cover the earth. He created lots of creatures abound in the sea, cover the earth. Man, he only made two, a male and a female. He tells them that they, we read later in scripture, that they were made for each other. Adam will say, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh because God gave her to him, took, him out of his, took her out of his side, not just his rib, I think the Bible teaches, but flesh and bone and other stuff, just not just the rib. But the point being that they were made by different means and they were told that they belong to one another. And they were told to be fruitful and multiply. And they were told to, make, to take dominion over all the animals. Not like the animals we are, we are higher than the animals. Not made in the image of God are the animals, but man is. Paul would say later on that there's one kind of flesh for fish, there's another kind of flesh for animals, and that there's another kind of flesh for man. These three categories of creatures, living creatures, line up with God's record of creation. And man is not evolved from animals, Animals are not evolving into man. We are different types of creatures. Now, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? You may or may not believe this, but people write books to explain what this means and why they think it means that. And the reason they can do that is because the Bible doesn't give us explicit instruction on what did God mean when he said that. We can make reasonable inferences as some theologians have said we ought to do. Certainly it includes the man's ability to speak, his intelligence, the ability to have dominion over things, his undying soul. But certainly there's more. Man was created with a love for God and a love for goodness. Sin has marred this horribly. But God made provision for this even before the fall. God doesn't react to what we do. I mean, sometimes in Scripture he reacts, but it's not as though he's surprised and has to change his plans. Right? God didn't make a different plan because of what Adam did in the garden. Jesus is described as being the very image of the invisible God. That's in Colossians 1.15. Man bears the image of the man made of dust, but, but the redeemed will bear the image of the heavenly man, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. As we are sanctified, we are being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of our creature, of our creator, Colossians 3.10, to be conformed to his image, 
Romans 8, 28. And we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.18. This being made in the image of God is being identified with him. Jesus being the very image of the invisible God is a way of expressing his very identity as God. And when we are told that we are being conformed to his image, we are being made like him. We are losing our identity with the man made of dust and we are being renewed after him who is the very image of God. It's kind of like when you pray in Jesus' name. It's not that that's a phrase that makes your prayer acceptable. You come to God the Father in the name of Jesus, identifying with him as one of his, praying according to what his word makes approved to us. That's what it means to pray in his name. To be made in his image, to be conformed to him in his image, is to be identified with him, to be, according to his name, part of his body. All of this is to show us how the saints relate to their God. That's what Moses wants us to understand. Made in the image of God, not something just to casually be thought of and disregarded. Oh, made in the image of God. Okay, I'm good. Think about who God is. Grabbed dirt, breathed life into it, created man, male and female, and called it in my image. That is stunning. Go back to that, to that psalm. All the inhabitants of the world should stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. Having made everything and set man in his kingdom, God saw that everything he had made, and indeed it was good. God took delight in his work. As Psalm 19, 1 through 4 declares, God provided in his creation a witness to his glory and his handiwork, Day and night reveal knowledge. Speech goes out throughout the earth to make him known. This was God's desire for creation, to make him known. This is why man was made in his image, to go out into the world and make him known. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All of this was done by the word of God in the span of last Monday to today. Six days, well, till yesterday, six days. Today, first day of the week, well, calendar, we can argue about the calendar. We get to the seventh day. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Both the heavens and the earth and the host of all of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Here we have Yahweh reviewing all he has done. He's finished the work of creation. He ended this work and he rested. God declared it to be very good. He's satisfied with what he's done. He blessed and sanctified the seventh day because he rested from his work of creation. And here, the creator of all things puts an exclamation point on the week. It is finished. It is finished. I might be so bold as to say this foreshadows the redemptive work of Christ, which also had an exclamation point or two, including his statement, it is finished. There is a parallel, I hope you see it, brothers and sisters, between creation and redemption. John 1, that I brought out early on, 
has some parallels with Genesis 1, there are some differences. And there's strong parallels between creation and redemption, but there are differences between the type and the fulfillment. That doesn't mean there aren't some connections there, and that's what I want us to see. So again, I'm going to point out that it's contrary to those who say everything continues to evolve. God's word is contrary to these people. They think that apes are evolving into men and men are evolving into super aliens. But the record that God has given us tells us that everything was created and made to reproduce after its own kind and the creation and the making of all things ended on the very good sixth day. You don't see any record of change from one kind to another. I won't go off on that. In blessing and sanctifying or setting apart the seventh day, I'll just say that all those people that call themselves transgender, they're not. There's no such thing. Men don't change into women and women don't change into men. God made them. He blessed and sanctified. He set apart the seventh day. He's expressing satisfaction in his work. And by resting, he's expressing enjoyment of his work. It's kind of like an earthly king. And Aaron brought this up uh, last, I guess it was last year, it was a while back, teaching on the temple and the typology we see through scripture. Earthly kings, they build their castle, they build their, their city, whatever, and they sit down as an expression of rule. The work is complete, now the rule has begun. And in, and in sitting down and resting, God is saying, that work is done. I'm not going to do that creation stuff anymore. I'm going to sit down. He doesn't cease from all of his work. He ceased from that one bit of work. He sits down to enjoy and to rule. And that's what he's still doing. And he says to his son, well, Jesus said, the Father has given to me all authority under heaven and earth. And so God, for the past 2,000 years and until he comes again, is expressing that rule through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he rules us here today by his spirit. He is very active, but he's not creating new creatures. There are some who say that God instituted a creation ordinance for the weekly observance of the Sabbath. And I won't go into all the details on why I don't think that's so, but I'll make a summary observation. The Hebrew word for rest in Genesis 2, 3, 2, 2 and 2, 3, where he says, um, mm -hmm, on the seventh day, God ended the work from which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because he rested from all of his work. That word for rest is not the same word, the same Hebrew word used in Exodus 16 and 20 and so on to describe the sign of the Mosaic Covenant, the weekly Sabbath. It's a different word. They both convey the idea of rest, but it's a different kind of rest. God entered into rest, serving as an example and a reason for the weekly Sabbath given to national Israel. On the other end of the redemption story, we have a similar correlation. In Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, you have this rehearsal from God talking about the rest that the nation was being given in the land of Canaan and how they did not enter in, most of them, because of unbelief. And in chapter 4, verse 9, we read that there remains a rest, some translations say Sabbath rest, for the people of God. This word rest in Hebrews 4, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 9, is not the same Greek word as that that describes the weekly Sabbaths for Israel. It's a Greek word used nowhere else in Scripture. It conveys a different kind of rest. They both rest, but they're a different kind of rest. The type found in Genesis 2 when God rested from his work was a different kind of rest than the weekly Sabbath. 
And the fulfillment or the antitype of that type is found in Christ Jesus, who provides a different rest than the weekly Sabbath provided. One brother had this to say about it in a book he wrote. If there were a moment when God could have plainly ordained a Sabbath practice for all people in all eons, it would have been here at the curse when mankind was condemned to work by sweat and toil through pain and grief. Uh, we haven't got to that part yet, but you know it's there. Um, there is no indication that there would be any rest for mankind until the head of the serpent was bruised by the forthcoming seed of Eve. In the Mosaic law, God commanded rest. In the New Covenant, Christ provides rest. Both types of rest rely on trust in God. You guys that own animals and you farm animals, I had an uncle and an aunt years ago that were dairy farmers, and you got to tend to those cattle every day. You can't skip a day. And when God told the Hebrew people, you rest and your animals rest. He's telling them, trust in me. Trust the one who created your animals to make sure that they're cared for on the day that you're to rest. And so when you come to faith in Christ, he's telling you, trust in the one who satisfied God's demands and gives you rest for your soul. And the rest that Jesus provides is far, far better than what this weekly Sabbath did. Both are good. Both are good from both are gifts from God. One was a shadow or a type, the other is the fulfillment. Now, there's another aspect of God's rest that we should pay attention to, and it's very practical. We in the US of A have been known, I don't know if we are anymore, but we have been known to be people of capitalism. And for many people, they have had their work as their consuming passion. I have known people that have lived way above their income because they thought that was the measure of success and they worked hard until they were 70 years old to pay off all that stuff and then they fell over dead. God did not need the rest, but he did that to give us an example. And we need to learn that we are given work to do and it's a lot harder because of sin but work is a gift from God anyway, and it's to be used rightfully. And so rest once a week from your works is a pattern for us because being made in the image of God, we are to learn from him and we should not be consumed with that which provides by our own hand the stuff of the earth that God has given to us to have. And so he has created us to be in community with one another, and he's given us, as time-bound creatures, a day to meet. And this ought to be a highlight of our lives as people of God, as saints being purchased by Christ. And to forsake what he has given us in this rest it's a type of the rest that we will enter into fully when he comes again and sin is done away with and temptation and death and decay is done away with. But it's a taste of what he has promised us and will give us in due time. This is nourishment for our souls provided by the one who gives us rest. So in conclusion, the first week of time, the beginning of time, space, and matter, God created, organized, and formed the beauty and complexity of everything that we tend to take for granted. I tend to take for granted. God made the grass and the trees. God created the animals. How many of you all have pets in the house? I do. God created the animals, and he gave them to us for us to be stewards of and to use them rightly. All of this set the stage for the reason why the universe was created. I don't believe the universe was created to have a universe. I believe the universe was created to bring glory to God, and I believe the Bible shows us that the redemptive plan of God that unfolds through all of Scripture is the primary means by which God is going to be glorified.
The eternal Son of God would take on flesh and come into time and space as the Son of Man. And we who were created in the image of God, made in the likeness of God, would throw the universe into a hell-bound spiral. And God, who would take on the likeness of man to complete the plan of redemption. In Genesis 9, after the flood, God gave Noah new instructions for life on the renewed earth. God said the fear and dread of man would be on every beast of the earth, sky, and sea. Every live creature was given into his hand for food as the plants had been in the garden. Genesis 9, I want to read right quick for you what he says following. Genesis 9, verses 4 through 6. But you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever shed man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For the, in the image of God he made man. Starting with Cain, man has displayed an unending desire to shed blood. To shed the blood of his fellow man. We, we know about the Supreme Court ruling of the United States. Yesterday, the Supreme Court ruling of Texas resurrected a 1923 law that says the shedding of blood and the atrocity called abortion is illegal in the state of Texas again. This law lay dead in the tomb after Roe v. Wade, but it was never repealed. And the Attorney General said, this law is now in effect. And the state was sued by some people that like to kill babies, and yesterday the state Supreme Court said no. There's nothing in the books that said this law had been set aside. It is in effect now because of the Dobbs ruling. And so in Texas, we now have a state in which it's illegal to kill babies. Man still wants to kill babies. Man loves to shed the blood of man. And God said, surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. But mere justice cannot make sinful man right with God. There must be mercy. And we sang about that from Lamentations. God's mercies do not end. And it's good for us that they don't. Because if your slate was wiped clean, you would still sin and need mercies anew. So the Son of God would come in the image and substance of man to suffer the wrath due us who were made in his image and Jesus would thereby reconcile wretched sinners to the glorious Creator. In this, God is highly glorified. And that's why I think this first week is so important. God has set the stage for the story of redemption that every sheep of God longs to experience. Creation was never intended as an end unto itself. It will come to an end one day. When the Lord returns, he said through Peter, everything here is going to be consumed by fire and it's going to be raised up incorruptible. Kind of like we are going to be. It's a resurrection. Creation was always meant to serve a greater thing, the glory of God in creation and eternity. It was very good because it was his handiwork, and it was very good because he knew what was coming. God wasn't surprised by the fall. I believe that God chose who he's going to save before he created the earth, before he created the universe. God planned everything. It's all unfolding according to his decree. Fallen man needs a savior. This was known to God before the fall. The Son of Man would be promised and sent. And that, brothers and sisters, is very good. And that's what we need to recall. It was very good because it is from God and it's for our benefit and His glory. Let's pray. Father, I do thank You for...
not leaving us to our own devices 